I want to introduce our fantastic panel. Um, Chris, Brooke, and Donald, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, super excited to hear what you have to say. And, uh, and welcome to another Sales Hacker webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Excited to be here, man. Excited to have you guys. <laughs> um, awesome. But before we, we really we really get dive into it, I do want to just get a bit more of a, an introduction by, from each of you so we can get a bit more acquainted. Um, Brooke, I'll throw it over to you. I know you've done a ton of these. You're, uh, you're, you, you've you been on the sales hacker community for a long time and uh, and uh, have a ton of experience around this uh, this topic. So thank you so much for joining us. Super excited to hear what you have to say and learn from you. But uh, please just give us a bit of background on yourself so we can get a bit more acquainted. Well, I appreciate the kind words in the intro to have you hype me up in all my meetings. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Brooke. Uh, I lead revenue enablement for the XDR organization at Outreach.io. If you haven't heard of the word XDR, it's because we made it up. It just refers to both of our inbound and our outbound team, MDR and SDR. Uh, so I'm working with the pipeline generating folks to help get them onboarded, ramped up, leverage your tech stack, be efficient in their role, and then, of course, get them all promoted in partnership with their managers. Um, before I got into enablement, though, I was a frontline SDR manager for about five years, three of which were here at Outreach to help build out our mid-market team. I've been an AE before, an SDR twice. Uh, so the inside sales team is very near and dear to my heart. And I'm super psyched uh, to be here with all y'all today talking about, uh, yeah, super powering your sales team. <laughs> Booyah. Well, we're super excited to have you um, and uh, give us some, uh, some, some, some key insights here. So thank you for joining us, Brooke. We really appreciate it. Um, I'll pass it over to Chris. Chris, thank you so much for joining us and uh, giving us your time today. Um, just give us a bit more background on yourself so we can get a bit more acquainted. Thank you, Mikey. I'm uh, energized to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Chris Cater. I am the manager of customer success uh, for a company called FlockJ based out of San Francisco. Uh, I have over 10 years of technology experience. And if you're doing the math right now, yes, I started as a teenager uh, straight out of high school. I, I jumped straight into tech and have not left because I love it so much. Uh, so great to, to meet everyone. And I look forward from learning from you in the chat, too. Amazing. That's, uh, that's, that's fantastic. I love to hear that stuff. And Flock J, thank you so much for sponsoring this event. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be great. Um, and last but not least, Donald, Donald, thank you so much for joining us. Super excited to have you here and, uh, and learn from you as well. Just give us a bit more background on yourself. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm here just to connect with, uh, learn from Brooke and Chris. So that was, that was it. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but I'm out of West Palm beach, Florida. I run an organization called the sales evangelist. We have a popular sales podcast, which you should check out called the Sales Evangelist Podcast. And I work with uh, new sellers, BDRs, uh, folks in the SaaS community trying to get improve their sales skills. And uh, it's, it's fun. Um, so that's a little bit more about me. And uh, you can check my LinkedIn to connect with me a little bit further. And uh, we can be friends and come to each other's house for Thanksgiving and Christmas. There you go. I love that. <laughs> so let's all get together. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to get together with everyone because... Like uh, I was telling the three of them in the, at the at the in the in the pre call, I'm in Vancouver, Canada, and I haven't met anybody on my team since I started here. So um, <laughs> we're excited to kind of uh, to to see what the next little bit uh, has in store. But I digress. Um, amazing. Well, thank you three so much for for joining us. Really excited to kind of uh, to to dive into the conversation here. But I'm going to start off with this. And Brooke, I'm going to throw it over to you to kind of kick us off here. But um, since I know you've built out many sales teams in the past, and I'm sure you came across many different challenges while doing that. Um, what were those challenges when you were recruiting and how, what were the challenges around retaining and, you know, growing your talent once you kind of brought them on board and did sales enablement, how would you use that to really help that whole process and those challenges? Sure. Yeah. So, um, as it relates to like challenges around recruiting, specifically like through the lens of DE and I and making sure you got a diverse team, I think the hardest part is we get in our own way. Uh, you know, we all have uh, a concept of what an excellent sales reps look like and whether we like it or not, we all tend to hire people like ourselves. <laughs> uh, so you really have to be intentional about looking for like what... Um, what areas of opportunity do I have and who can I hire in to help build a team that's really strong with a diverse set of skills and not just replicate the, my one superstar or myself uh, or whoever it is that I want on the team. Once you get them in seat, that's half the battle, whether you're talking about hiring folks of color or more women on the team, if they're the only one and you leave them out to dry, they're probably not going to stick around for very long. So making sure that you are supporting your reps, um, 
giving people the resources that they need. And that could mean, uh, you know, like making sure that they've got a buddy could be as simple as that could be on the enablement side, ensuring that you have multiple different types of training. So like I just came from a boot camp, so I was a little tardy. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> uh, but we got to make sure that we're uh, um, meeting people where they're at. So not everybody learns well over Zoom. So I got to have the same information in a written format. And then I got to do the same thing in like some kind of exercise module. And then we have to have learning on the job opportunities. Because just like you can't hire all the same people, we all learn differently and we all thrive with different types of feedback. So I think it's just like an awareness and an intentionality of like, if you want to hire a diverse team, you have to have diverse tactics <laughs> and make sure that that carries through all the way through their life cycle um, from start to promotion. Love it. Yeah, I can. I, I love your point there too. I, you know, creating a, a diverse team because if, if you hire the, the, a bunch of people that are having like the same quality, the same traits, there could be some uh, headbutting, I guess you could say, mm. right? But finding yeah. a, group, a team that that works very dynamically together, then you know you're going to see uh, some great success. Yeah, and that. honestly, to your point about headbutting, you'd be okay with a uh, um, differing opinion, like a dissenting opinion, right? Like uh, if I just hired a bunch of me's, we'd probably be okay for like a little bit, but then at some point we're going to reach a ceiling because there's no one to say like, "Hey, lady, that's not a very good idea." Or <laughs> have you thought about doing it a different way? Um, and that all comes down, you know, like building a strong team culture and making sure people feel comfortable sharing their points of view uh, and are, are being heard as well. Yeah, love that. Fantastic. Um, great. Well, Chris, I would love to hear your thoughts. What are some of the challenges that you've seen, um, you know, when recruiting, retaining and growing talent um, yeah. over, over your time? Yeah, Mikey, I, I, I like the things that, that Brooke was was mentioning uh, specifically for me. I think if we if we put a more intentional focus on that growth part. In my experience, it can solve those first two with the hiring and retaining, because if you're focusing on the learning and development of your team, right, like you're, you're letting them know that, Mike, you're important to me. And I'm going to show you that by giving you opportunity, uh, whether it's for a promotion or for experiences, new experiences that you haven't had before, whether it's access to learning material and learning content. I'm showing you personally, Mikey, that I care about you. Uh, I believe that the the employees will begin to, to see and they'll tell their friends, you know, they'll be evangelists for the company and that, and that can help with the hiring part. And then when you're on the interviews, the, the recruiters can also share, hey, we're a company that, that focuses on that development aspect. So for me, if you focus on the growth part, I, I think it can solve the, the, the first two. Totally. <laughs> really holding in. Yeah, you're, you're so right, man. Because it's like, I, I find that um, if you're not, getting the opportunity to see how you can excel in your current position or in your current company, then I'm just going to feel stagnant. I don't feel like I'm going to put the effort that I, the company may deserve or that I feel like I, I should, I should put in. Right. So um, I think that's a, that's a great point. It's a really good point. Um, Donald, do you have any thoughts on, on that one? I do. Um, we did an episode last year around the idea of, uh, uh, for one of our shows around, um, you know, a diverse team and so forth. And many of the teams I worked on, I was, uh, I'm just going to be straight up. Um, I was token. <laughs> I was one of the only ones in the organization. And what I cut, what I love what Brooke shared there was this notion of how can we, you know, giving somebody a buddy or, you know, if you're leaving somebody to hang out to dry for long, they're not going to want to stick around. Like you got to build a culture um, uh, that you're, that this is an organization where we have that uh, diverse idea. And one of the things that I like is too, was when we discussed this in our show was like, you know, you have folks that are diverse on your team. Well, find out from them too. Where are some other folks that are diverse or, you know, would be at? And what are some of the things that might be attractive? We can't go back to the same the same playbook that we ran. Let's go to the same five schools that we've gone to for the past 10 years and recruit people. Why don't we look for, look outside the bubble and find some other folks? And here's the other thing too, like um, I love sales and I teach, I have a belief that anyone can sell if they have the desire. All we have to do is teach them and guide them on the right principles. And I think sometimes we do a big emphasis, you know, on like, we got to have like a, you know, um, you know, we limit our capabilities to getting people because we have these, these strict requirements that are not necessarily conducive. That's going to make somebody effective in a, in a role. So what I mean by that is like looking at somebody's resume, if they didn't end, uh, you know, graduate from college, does that mean they can't make a great sales rep? 
And I think sometimes people's resume is beyond just like the written stuff. It's like, what, are the, what experience those individuals have that we can get access to? I mean, I know a lot of people who are great sellers, but they've not traditionally sold before and they just need that refinement. And we do that with our enablement programs. So I feel like, you know, getting outside of our comfort zone, having that diverse thought, diverse discussion about where can we recruit people from other than just to think the same, uh, same water and holes makes a big difference. And getting our team members, now it's not my, t- it's not your, your, your diverse team members underrepresented team members job to be able to grow your organization and your diverse team but it's you can still get their input that can help with the uh with the the leadership getting outside of their comfort zone and and, and their own um, recruitment strategies that are not the same i don't know if I, that makes sense um no i think you know what i was going to say i think it makes perfect sense because i've always i've always thought every single person is selling at some point in their life right like whether it's getting a job you're selling yourself right you're getting into a new house you're selling how i want that apartment you know so it's always just there, there's multiple different areas but it's like what you said donald is refining it to a different kind of approach yeah um, and i think that's a that's a really good uh, a great point there um sweet but i also want to kind of touch on on the point of you know having a buddy from what donald and and, and brooke were were speaking to how have you seen you know having access to some of the top performers um within your your, your teams help those new ones to the team because that's what when i was starting out as an sdr i went straight to the aes and the senior sdrs and i was like okay what are you doing to be good i need to learn and i want to learn from you so how have you uh, how have you how have you been able to do that with your team do you encourage them do you like you say do you set up a buddy system um chris i'll start off with kind of what what, what you think about that yeah, you know, I, I think I'll start with, with the benefits of of having kind of that that buddy system and, and not just one buddy, but also opening up opportunities to learn from from others, because maybe not everyone proactively reaches out to those AEs like you did, Mikey. So I think that it's it's up to the manager to kind of foster some of those relationships. Uh, I think that the biggest benefit that I've seen is giving that that seller a new tool, right, a new tool in your toolkit. And an example that I can think of is if if you hired me, Mikey, to to be uh, to hang pictures, right? And I come and I'm the best duct tape picture person you've ever seen in your life. I can duct tape the heck out of a photo to a wall. And you hired me for that. So that's okay. Uh, let's say you then say, hey, Chris, I want you to go talk to Brooke because she knows how to put frames around pictures. And I'm like, wait, you could put a frame around a photo? And then Brooke shows me maybe some metal frames. And then I say, well, oh, that metal frame is nice. Uh, I like that idea. Maybe I get a wooden frame, right? So I, now I have a toolkit of putting a frame around a photo. Then Mikey, you say, hey, look, Donald knows how to do this thing where you put a, a hammer and a nail in the wall and uh, it allows you to put the picture on without duct tape. Duct tape's awesome, but you know maybe you might like the, the nail idea, right? And so I say, I'll try it. And so then I, I, I hammer that thing to the wall and now I've learned how to put a frame on my photo from Brooke. Uh, Donald has now taught me how to, how to hammer the photo to the wall. And now I may step back and be like, ooh, duct tape was really cool, but this looks awesome, right? So I think that introducing your teammates to people who have these strengths, not just a singular buddy, but opening up a, a community where we can lean and learn on each other through the, the experiences we have and the, the, the uh, skills that we have, I think can, can make the team a lot stronger. We got some, some new, new tools. I That's, love that, Chris. And I think like uh, to your point of um, building a system around it, it, it can start as early in boot camp where it's like, hey, like I need SME subject matter experts to lead sessions. Why don't I just ask the managers, like, who on your team is not only great at their job, but like, you know, seems to naturally enjoy mentorship because inevitably they're going to lead a session and someone's going to ping them again and ask them questions again. Um, So we can uh, kind of force that interaction that way. And I think you do really need to force it, especially if you're hybrid or fully remote, because not only do you not run into people, but if you are an introverted salespeople, they exist. I'm one of them. (laughs) Um, And you're like, horrified or like really scared to go reach out to Mikey and be like, Mikey, tell me about all your secrets. Uh, if I've got like a, a pre-selected thing on my calendar or something with an agenda, that's like, Hey, so-and-so is an expert on this topic. Here's some questions you might want to ask. It just eases that, uh, rapport building. I like that idea. Like, you know, it's, it's almost like a menu for a restaurant. Like, you know, here are some, here are four, you know, four of our team members who have different responsibilities and different things that you should ask them about, um, you know, maybe uh, go to the duct tape guy. He can get some good duct tape <laughs> from that. <laughs> get, some, get some good ideas on 
on that. And this person is really, you know, Brooke kills it on LinkedIn. So maybe get some strategy, ask her these questions. She loves um, budget an hour because she's going to tell you all about LinkedIn. So, you know, it's like, that would be like really cool. And I think the other part to that too, is I hoping to build a culture within the organization. I, I was chatting with a, a sales leader yesterday. And one of the things that he's talking about was in their company, they focus this idea of the transparency. Like mm-hmm. everyone is, everyone, they want people to like, they, they really push this idea of messing up. And I know some people say that and they just like, you know, it's, it's nice, you know, just to say, but they are really big on like, you can mess up, but you need to own it and need to be transparent about it. And then let's all learn from each other. And I think if there's a culture of like, this is our mission, like individually, you're a sales rep and you're trying to get some money naturally, but as an organization, we're trying to make everyone better because we're just as strong as our weakest link. Let's have that culture built um, where, you know, your, your, your more senior sellers do that, where they take somebody underneath their wings. Um, obviously, the formal program would be great, but just like being able to have that channel and having that opportunity where we're a culture of, of helping each other makes magic happen. And I think that ties back to the mission and comes back to a little bit with leadership as well. Yeah, I love that, Donald, because that creates a, a sense of vulnerability, right? And that's a great mm-hmm. space to learn in, because if I'm just hiding my mistakes, I, maybe I'm not growing from it, right? Like I'm just hiding it each time. Yeah. But you're right. If the, the, the leadership can create that, that opportunity to, that it's okay to fail fast, then yeah. you know, I, I'm okay to be like, look, I made a hundred cold calls in a row and I got zero book meetings from that, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with now sharing that at the safe space. Yeah. And especially you being a, say you're, you know, you've been with the company for say two, three years and I'm brand new, two days old. And I just got through boot camp with Brooke. And then Brooke told me you're one of those top folks and you're willing to chat, but then you put into team Slack or whatnot, like, you know, this is one of the mistakes, some a challenge that I had. It's like, holy crap, how can that God make a mistake? Like I, I want to go talk to him and figure out what can I learn uh, from him? Because now you're approachable and you're human as well. So that's right. Love it. I think to uh, going just looping back um, and uh, talking to what all three of you have said about how, you know, one person might be an expert at this, one person might be an expert at this, one person might be an expert at this, having that kind of some sort of like formula, especially for companies that have a multi-product solution Mm -hmm. um, and having experts on each one of those, and then kind of having those workshops with each one of those people can really benefit those new sellers as well because i worked for a company that we had something like that and it was super helpful so every time i had a question about x product i'd go direct i know directly to go to and i'd get all the answers whereas i would ask somebody else that is also selling that product but they just don't really know it as well so they're like go talk to sarah right um so yeah i to- I-, I i love that um sweet this is great but um okay i want to talk about kind of now building out the sales team and how sales enablement um, can help that. Brooke, I'll start with you. I know you're in the middle of a a boot camp right now. Um, So I would love to kind of hear your thoughts, how you foresee companies using sales sales enablement to help build out their their sales team and kind of some of the processes that you're currently doing um, at Outreach. Sure, yeah, I think um, strong partnerships between sales enablement and their sales managers. They really are that it's it's a strategic partnership and it's not just training for training sake of like, all right, you come in and you drink from the firehouse. Here's all the information you could possibly need. We check the box. We say we've done it. It's not very sustainable long-term. And when you're thinking about bootcamp, you need to start with like a, an outcome approach of like, not just, I have three days. What can I shove into Mikey's brain in three days? But like in these three days, what are the most important things that someone needs to know before they get onto the floor and not like really understand, but just taking, we call it the awareness competency mastery approach of like, my goal is that by the time you leave boot camp, Chris and Donald and Mikey, you know where to go find answers to your questions because nobody likes to feel helpless and people want to feel empowered. They're like, oh yeah, I can figure this out. I know where the directions are. I know where the map is. I'm lost right now, but I can figure it out. And then be prescriptive with my line of questioning instead of just being like, help me manager. I'm so lost. Um, so, so I think that's important. Like being focused on what outcomes do you want? And then taking like a really realistic and reasonable approach to like, at what point do you want somebody when you're thinking about ramp, like what skills do they need? And can I build upon? And we're talking about like being okay with failure and like learning in a safe environment. I can't expect that somebody who j- has never been in sales is going to come onto the sales floor. And when they leave my boot camp, no matter how highly I think of the program that I built, that they're going to be converting at like a 25% conversion rate. We got to set appropriate expectations. Uh, so making sure that like people know how they're being measured. 
uh, that you're partnering with your managers on like what's actually happening on the floor. Are we seeing trends long term, quarter after quarter of the cohorts that come in so that we can change the topics that are uh, like in onboarding? Uh, and then just co- constantly keeping that tight communication, because if I just exist in a vacuum, let's be real. I've been out of the game of a frontline manager for a year now. I, I think I know what they need, but like, I don't actually know unless I'm constantly talking to them. So I think it, it really is like a lockstep um, approach to like, anytime you build a program, making sure you've got good feedback from your managers and, and you take a, the approach of like, what do the people actually need to know coming out of it? Long answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that was honestly, I thought that was succinct. You know, you could probably go, go on for quite a while. Um, I was engaged. I was listening to that boy. I love your here. point. I love your point there, Brooke. How it's just, um, you know, everyone that starts a new job, it's like, oh, you're, it's so stressful. You're a sponge, you know, you're, you're learning so much. The learning curve is crazy. But if you can kind of understand that, yes, the learning curve is, is, is going to be tough, but actually just kind of focus on is these are the points that you really need to know in order to at least have a basis to be successful instead of just throwing tons of information at somebody. Yeah. I love that. I love that approach because I've been on, on both sides, right. Where it's like, okay, great. I actually feel comfortable here and I can see how I can build from this basis. Right. Rather than just being like, all right, there's so much going on. Where do I put what, what fits where um, and so on. So, yeah. Yeah. And even like uh, one thing that we're experimenting with, or I guess we're like, piloting, we just started doing it is, um, 30, 60, 90 plans. Like I think everybody Mm -hmm. have it in their brain of like what I want someone to do, but documenting it and not listing quota. Cause it's quite obvious that like you are your, your quota is your job. (laughs) So like, well, I don't need to say it over and over again and like add anxiety to your life. But like in order to hit that, like in your first 30 days, you should be actively using this tool set. If you don't have access to these, you should have called IT. You should be aware of where the script is. Month two, maybe like I'm not just doing fake role plays with Chris. Like I'm actually bringing recorded calls to Chris so that he can give me feedback on what I'm doing. Month three, you know, it's like I'm, I'm measuring myself not only on those calls, but like on my conversion rate. So you, you build upon it because I think confidence is so crucial for salespeople, especially SDRs, because the job is tough. You just get yelled at <laughs> oftentimes <laughs> and people who aren't expecting you to call. So making sure that we're setting people up for success to say, hey, yes, it's a tough job. Just because you're not a superstar, you're not Michael Jordan right out the gate doesn't mean you're a failure. You're learning and that's okay. And here's what we expect of you. Yeah. And what I love about this is a data side. Like it's yeah. just, I'm a big, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with data. You come into my, 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 uh, my, uh, my screen, you're going to see like three Excel documents going at one point because there's, you know, tracking that data is so critical. And uh, going back to this notion of like, if I can see my performance, I'm a big believer that you're competing against your yesterday. And if I can help my reps or help the team members, like how can we beat what you did yesterday? It's going to magic's going to happen. And I, I feel like sometimes as leaders, when it comes towards like, I've been in that role where, you know, you, you tell someone like, let's just go get some appointments, make it happen. And then you realize I can't just tell them to turn on a faucet and appointment comes out. It's like, are they doing the, 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 the process they're doing the activities they're doing the the motions are they hitting the the milestones and that's why i love that 3060 plan because now as an individual i have my quote unquote like my progress record to see where i'm at what's expected of me and how am i performing and then how can i get to that that next level and the pressure is not quite there i know if i if i continue down this path and do these things that i learn in boot camp it's going to help me to be able to get to the 25 percent conversion rate but right now 15 or 10 is I know I'm not. Uh, I know I'm not horrible um, because that's what it's understood that I'm ramping up to. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm loving that that thirty sixty ninety plan, not just for the onboarding, but just going forward too, because it, yes. it is, it's allowing a, a big level of of prepping. And um, you know, I, I think I, I think I, I've been blessed with some great managers who who can be really reactive, right? They can say, Chris, I noticed you did this, so you should start doing this. And I, and I think that's great. But I think the thirty sixty ninety plan that Brooke mentioned and that Donald touched on uh, is also giving a level of proactivity, right, based on the trends. And that's one of the secret weapons that the enablement team can have is, hey, look, before you even have this problem, let me tell you a little bit about <laughs> what you can do before it happens, right? Uh, you, you can whoever your favorite psychic is, that's a Raven or or Sean Spencer from Psych, right? Like you're you're thinking. Hey, here's what might happen. Uh, let, let me help you out with that. Here's what we've noticed in the past. Uh, here's what you can do if that happens. Totally. And like to Donald's point about data, in an ideal world, we all have all of the information that we need and the data infrastructure internally to say, hey, I know for a fact that top performers execute at this clip. They do this many activities. And here's the skills that you need. And then I just work backwards. I put them in the boot camp to the 306090 plan. Uh, if I'm being totally candid, I think 
I can speak on my behalf. We're not quite there where I have the crystal ball, uh, but you can work toward <laughs> that. Like, partnering with your managers and like, just getting constant feedback from the team of like, what do you need to be successful? As opposed to what I used to do all the time as a frontline manager was like, well, I think if I were doing it this way, here's how I would do it. And it was just a carbon copy of what was in my brain uh, and like a best guess, but we can, we can do better than that. <laughs> yeah. Go back to what you said with the the idea, and, and everyone is loving the psychic idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> go back to mine is Lady Cleo, um, the yeah. fellow Jamaican here, right? Um, <laughs> but go back to that that notion of like um, also getting the information from you know active participant people who are out in the field right now, and I think that's really really cool there from the frontline managers as well as those those people who are frontline, the BDRs who just went through ninety days ago or you know uh, six months ago. Like, what are some of the experiences they're having? Some of the challenges that they're seeing coming across because that's going to also again add that real-time fuel to the fire real-time data so and honestly like um we are at outreach are a big fan of surveys just like the google form yes we just time it in enablement <laughs> to send out like hey we know that like during your 30 60 90 days and after your first week of boot camp it's not only like did you like the c- content that was in there but like how prepared are you to execute on these what we believe to be key activities mm-hmm. And if we're constantly getting feedback that like, I, I had a great time at boot camp, but I'm a two out of five on making cold calls. Like we have some work to do. Uh, <laughs> and it's really good feedback and it takes people two seconds to fill out. Oh, love it. Oh, so good. <laughs> yeah. I also love the 30, 60, 90 day uh, plans in on the personal side, outside of work that helps me kind of almost get in the mindset to then perform really well in my, in, in, in my work environment. Right. So um, that's great. That's, that's great feedback. I love that. Um, so going on, I want to continue on with what Brooke was saying about how she's still, you know, continuously learning to build out the best boot camp that you that you've got. How have you guys been able to, you know, help team members embrace continuous learning, especially once you get to a point where, all right, I'm kind of killing this. Um, I understand the process. I know everything so well. Um, how are you getting your team to embrace kind of going? further learning more, going more in depth, maybe um, diving into different areas of the, of the business or whatever it may be. Um, Chris, what, 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 what do you think? Yeah. You know, for me, it's, it's making learning cool, right? It's, it's mentioning it. It's talking about it. It's, Hey, Brooke, I watched this really great LinkedIn learning the other day about managing up. You should check it out. Right. Or, or Donald, uh, you know, I was in this webinar and it reminded me of something you and I chatted about. Like, I think constant conversation about it is is a very easy, very easy way uh, to get people talking about the learning and development, to get people checking out some of the things that you talked about. Uh, there could be informal book clubs uh, where, where we get together and we talk about uh, something that we learned from that. Uh, so to your question, for me personally, it's just making it to where learning is cool. I love that, Chris. And learning like- is fundamental. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, Donald, but just um, you know, figure out what motivates your people. As a frontline manager, you're probably closer to it than maybe I might be in enablement. But like, if I know that Donald wants to be an account executive and that's his dream right now as an SDR, and I'm having a hard time getting him to focus on KPIs or, or executing something, I learned this from Marlena Moeller. She's very, she's brilliant. She's a um, sales leader at Attentive. She said, um, you know, find out what it is that motivates them and say, hey, Donald, we know that top candidates for account executive positions, not only do they hit their KPIs, but they have really good data and they're able to explain why is it that they're doing so well on the phone. So when you get into that interview or you get into that role with your future VP of sales, you can explain those things and just spinning it in a way that's not like I'm coming down to hit you with the hammer if you didn't make your 60th dial today. <laughs> like what the what's in it for you? And uh, detaching to Chris's point, yeah, making it cool and exciting and normalizing like, hey, everybody here is trying to level up what they're doing. One thing that we do internally and goes along with both of you are sharing there is uh, this, the idea, again, I, I always go back to where's the source of the the challenge. And I think um, I've been a part of those organizations that were just like absolutely amazing. And the ones that were like, yeah, lackluster. And one of the things that I find, and I'm not pulling away from the individual's accountability here. It's just that there's a sense of that leadership. If the leaders can help to shape that culture. And I like what you shared there, Brooke, like, you know, if, and others, like if you share some ideas, maybe it was you, Chris, so if you share some ideas about what you're doing, like it was you, Chris, my bad, um, things that you're doing. And then, you know, a webinar that you went to and it's like, hold on, let's scratch this. My, my manager has time to go to a webinar to learn something. Well, this is something that's important for me. And again, the leaders on uh, folks on a team in our meetings, in our team meetings, in our huddles, what are the things that I do is I push them to figure come to the table with something. Uh, we have our podcast. 
So um, it's okay if they bring other podcasts to the table and say, hey, I listened to this podcast and I heard this. This was really cool. And I'm like, dude, that's amazing. That's awesome. Let's take, you know, let's, let's try to apply that because I can still learn and I'm learning from them. Like one of our reps is like, he kills it with videos and I love videos, but he's doing some different things. And I love that. And the way that he's taking advantage of LinkedIn, they're teaching me things as well. So it's this culture of like, dude, I'm doing a podcast. I'm teaching you all, but, you know, bring some stuff to the table as well. And we educate each other because we're constantly improving because I want to still outbeat my yesterday. And I need to always beat them because we're a competitive team uh, in a good competitive level. <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to call out. So my manager, Whitney Seek, she's really good about uh, emailing the team. And like you said, Donald, just like making it, uh, you know, it's optional. I'm not, it's not like a mandatory optional piece of flair that like you should, if you really want to look good in this webinar, <laughs> it's like, Hey, professional development opportunity, totally optional, but here's the yeah. information. And then that's all it is. And it's just like a constant flow. And now it's, um, I see it in our team. People are constantly sending stuff around it. So start from the top for sure. Yeah. It's like, if you keep doing, I've, you know, I, one of my trainers used to tell me this when I first went through sales training, it's like there's reps out there who have, you know, you've probably all heard some kind of variation to this. Who've been selling for 30 years with one year of experience. And I'm just like, bro, that hit me when I first heard that. And I was like, I never want to be that rep. So I'm always looking for how can I make sure I still have my, you know, my 18 years I've been doing this for 18 years of experience with, you know, because I'm learning stuff each day and reading books and and so forth. And that it just it just sharpens your your iron sharpens iron and it sharpens your tools so you can be more effective. And yeah, so I love it. One more point I want to touch on there is that, yeah, like you said, Donald, it's understanding that we all have this opportunity and grow to learn. Uh, and and uh, before our show started, we were talking about how, uh, spoiler alert, uh, the Brooklyn Nets are out of the playoffs, if you're a basketball fan. And uh, we were talking about how at the beginning of the season, they did seem a little bit cocky, right? Like, you know, I had Kyrie Irving talking about he didn't need a coach. And it's like, you kind of do, right? You just got swept in the playoffs, right? So uh, I think that that's, a, that's a, a big aspect there, not only from manager perspective, coach, but the player perspective as well, just understanding that uh, you, you got room to grow. And you know, that, that's an example maybe you all could use with your teams if you want. Uh, you know, people like making fun of Kyrie anyway. So just hey, <laughs> like Kyrie guy doesn't like a coach and you see what happened to him, right? Right, like you guys can steal that one. Well, I think world. that's like that's like the new uh, Iverson practice. What practice? <laughs> practice? Coach, what hey. coach? I can manage myself, man. Right. Well, the, the world's flat, right? Yeah. <laughs> we all love. Okay. Um, yeah, that's good. Um, but yeah, going back to Donald, what you said about you know how someone from your team brought a podcast right to you and was like, "Hey, we should try this out." This is what we're trying to do right now, right here, right? Is the people on the call are going to take or want to take, they're here to learn from what's going on. And that's what, you know, that's why I originally came over to sales hacker was because I would be hopping onto all these webinars and then I'd be like, I would, I built out our, our old, my, my old company, our uh, outbound, our outbound process. Right. And I learned 100% from thought leaders like you. So um, yeah, I, I love the, the, the idea of continuous learning and, you know, if you're not trying to grow, then you know what? What are you really trying to trying to achieve, right? So I fired him afterwards because he didn't listen to our podcast. I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, cool. So I want to I want to touch on, a, on another on another point here. So we're companies are growing fast; they're getting bigger, and teams are dispersed, right? Um, especially in this virtual world, where you know, like I said, I've never actually met anybody on my team in person. Um, how have you been able to kind of connect those teams together to make sure that they are syncing, they're working well together. And, um, like going back to our other point of, you know, who's the expert at X, Y, Z, who's the expert over here. How have you been able to kind of do that in a virtual setting? And then also in, a, a, a an in-person setting, once everybody's kind of back to that or even hybrid, right? Um, Chris, I'll, I'll throw it to you. Um, I'm so glad you, you asked this question because this part is important to me. Uh, I, I think that for me, it's intentionality is one, but then also creating space for some uh, some camaraderie building, right? Like to talk about the SME program is, is amazing. We're a big proponent of that. But I also think that as managers, we can open up space for, uh, for our team to talk about you know, sports or to talk about things that are happening in their life, like creating a space and time for those kind of more casual conversations because they would happen in the office, right? Like if we're, we're walking to the water cooler, we're you know, traditional water cooler, we're walking to the kitchen, we'll have those opportunities. 
But uh, in a virtual space, it's like every time I join a, a Zoom meeting, it's always about something work related. And, and I feel pressure to only talk about that. Uh, so I think that that we have the onus is kind of on the management to create the opportunity to have more uh, rapport building conversations and rapport building opportunities. Mm. I love that, Chris. And I apologize if you can hear a giant dog snoring next to me. He's really loud. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, when you talk about like doing it on purpose, you're so right. Cause like, you know, normally we'd shoot the breeze in the hallway and I, now I'm like, okay, we're on our 30 minutes. Let's build rapport. <laughs> like, it's a little awkward. Um, and one thing that we're doing, I think Malia, my teammates actually on this call, uh, we do coffee chats. Uh, and I think it's, it's like every couple of weeks, just a rotating spreadsheet, but you get 20 minutes and you get talking points and you're not allowed to talk about work and you truly just shoot the breeze. And it's just part of our standard operating rhythm. Cause you're right. If you don't force it to happen with a remote team, all you end up talking about is work and there's not a lot of time to like get to know what you did on the weekend. Your team huddle meeting is going to be too many people to go around the horn and say, what'd you do on Saturday? <laughs> like there's just no time. So you have to make time, whether it's coffee chats, or um, trivia games. I love icebreakers and I make all my new hires play them with me of like answering, get to know your questions, uh, spin the wheel kind of stuff. Uh, you got to keep it light, not take yourself seriously. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, love the, I love the coffee chat, Brooke, because um, we did at, at my, you know, I'll, I'll give, wasn't my idea, I'll give credit to Scott Barker, but um, at my uh, last company, we did coffee roulette, right? So everybody would be it, and it wasn't just on your sales team. It was almost like on an organization wide. So we'd start to learn about products, right? We'd start to learn about marketing on the sales team so we could kind of get a better understanding. And it it brought the the culture um, really nicely together, right? So um, I like that a lot. Um, Chris, what do you, what, what do you, what, what do you, or sorry, Donald, do you have any, any further thoughts yeah. on, on that? Yeah, dude. No. Um, one of the things that I like to do with it is the the food. I mean, I, I, mean, I like to eat. So uh, <laughs> um, we like the idea of that food as well. So, you know, the coffee chat and our team's smaller. So getting folks to either we pay for lunch um, every once in a while or having them to, you know, people just jump on with lunch and just chatting um, and uh, eating with us. And it just makes that, that idea of, of the the group. It makes it fun. And we, we talk about random stuff. Uh, Kahoot. We definitely took advantage of that a little bit. They were playing some games. Uh, with our team and it was i got a chance to learn about some of our teammates that um things i didn't know and i'm grateful for the pandemic that that allowed it happen because um some of them i will not bet in trivia anymore because <laughs> they'll kick my butt so uh one of them is just like movie buff and i was like i had no clue jake knew that much about movies so um anyways it's just things like that just made me yeah. get a chance to know my team a little better um from that but it's just going back to the intentional idea and then also like we are a big fan of slack as well <laughs> so like everybody else so we um we are slack channels and we have different stuff and we tell people to post like different things in in the slack channel in our team meetings one of the things we start off with is like tell us what happened something that happened amazing in your life non-related non-work related over the past week and that also brings conversation and then those leads into some of the other chats like one of our team members i'm going to literally write a book about things that happened to him over the weekend like over <laughs> week like the stuff that happens to this guy and he's not making them up he has proof i'm like your life is amazing um and scary so we're gonna sell it um as well so. like you know what else is kind of fun that our london office started doing that the americans have adopted is uh show and tell and it sounds oh, boring, but like on friday huddles it's labeled the friday fun huddle so it's just like a shoot the breeze huddle everybody comes on and then like every friday the team is huge. So they just pick two people and you get like five minutes to make a slide deck of like <laughs> your hobbies. What, like, do you have a dog? And I remember there was one rep who was like, I don't have a dog, but here's pictures of dogs I see on the street. Cause you see, <laughs> <people don't> like <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, you know, you get to learn about people's obscure hobbies and talents that may not come up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I Another, like great one one. Dogs. Another great one. Wiki races for anybody's out there. Really. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Uh, races. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, awesome. Well, okay. I got, I just got a couple more things that we want to get through before I let you all go. We only have uh, 60 minutes left here or what, however much we got. Um, but I want to ask about how you are making sure that, you know, we're, you, you're providing um, the right sales enablement resources for, for what your sellers actually want. How have you been able to do that? Sometimes I've in the past I've I've gotten stuff where like I don't know really sure how this is really helping me. We just spent a bunch of time on this when we could have spent it 
on something else that I know would have been very, very beneficial um, to my process or to help me kind of grow in any way, shape or form. Um, Donald, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that came back, we, we kind of hit, hit on a little bit, it's just getting information from them. What's working for them? What are some of the challenge? I, I have a big, uh, um, I've been on a, a soapbox recently about this. I, I did a panel um, at one of our meetups and we talked to some of these execs. And one of the things that they shared was that their adoption rate of their tech was like, uh, I don't know, it's like 40% or some crazy number. I'm like, that's nuts. Like why are people not using it? Because oftentimes it's kind of like, hey, we found RevOps and we found a cool thing. This would be great. Let's go ahead and get it for the team to utilize. And they're not, it's not something that the team is using or uh, care to use per se. And it's like, interesting, like what is working? And I, the, oftentimes the conversation, and that's an ex- example, maybe a little different, but the point is like the, the conversation wasn't being, ha- wasn't happening with, What's working? What are you doing? How can we improve? Then let's go ahead and get a tool and add on to the tech stack. And for instance, one of my top performers, I coached this guy and he, um, I'm a big fan of, uh, the, you know, sales enablement tools. And one of them that, uh, you know, we all know is like, you know, Gong or some of these other, um, you know, assistants. And um, I said, uh, are you using your Gong? And he's like, no, I don't use it. I'm like, interesting. Why is that? He's like, in my calls, I feel like it's intruding on the conversation. Now he's a top performer in the organization and, you know, they, they allowed him to do whatever he, you know, not whatever, but allows him to, to do that. But he turns off Gong because he said it felt like it was intruding on information. And I was like, you know, what did the leadership, you know, thoughts and so forth on this? And the, the point is like, they're paying for this and thinking that it's going to be something great for the whole organization, but it didn't actually get from him what's using. And he said that that allows for him to have more candid conversation and uh, also like uh, uh, makes it a little bit more personal for him and his clients. And clearly it's something is working for him. Not that everyone needs to turn off gong, but the idea though is, is there a better way that we can still get information and could there something else that we could have gotten from from Scott to understand how to best help him? And I, I anyways, start from getting down to the, the trenches and figure out what people are using, what challenges they're facing. And then I feel that's able to help us with uh, um, what they need and give them the right things. Totally. And to that point, Donald, it's not just like from a tech adoption perspective. It's not just uh, did they turn it on, but like, what did we buy this for? And like, is it yeah. the outcome? So like using data to say, hey we wanted to do this. This was the business outcome we expected. Are we on track to that or not? Uh, being really clear with your reps, Whitney's like montage, we always talk about it. Outreach is like, what's the purpose process and payoff? Like mm. straight with people like, Hey, we're doing this thing because of this, we expect to get this kind of payoff and here's how it's going to happen. Like we got to buy into this now. Uh, and then be okay saying no. I think in enablement, we get a lot of requests for like, Hey, like a reactive so-and-so got roasted on the phone. Let's spin up a whole training on this one objective handling for the whole team. And you're like, okay, is that actually what's happening? So like, do it, whether it's in a QBR or like whatever your cadence is for measuring the success of your sales team, using that to drive your programming. Oh, love it. Brooke, we need to be best friends. Done. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> you already invited everyone for Thanksgiving, Donald. So I did. I got, I got a LinkedIn invite saying that. So Chris is coming. I got this other guy named Dave's coming. <laughs> I'll be there, I'll be there. Oh, there we go. We got uh, got Mikey coming. Everybody's coming. We got the Canadians coming down. Yeah, we got some jerk chicken at uh, Christmas dinner and uh, on Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris, what what are your thoughts on that? Man? Yeah, for for me, I I want to go back to what uh, Donald was talking about being in the trenches and Brooke mentioned about the surveys. I think just keeping that pulse on the team. Uh, some an experience that I had at that that recently worked is uh, kind of creating like a, a Slack channel. For, for whatever enablement or um, some some just way to keep up with post, right? Because it's one thing to say, okay, we know this part of the product, we know this objection is tough and, and then you teach it. But I think the really important part, and Brooke touched on this earlier, is being able to say, okay, now what do we do with this information we just learned? Or what did you learn from that? Uh, one other helpful aspect could be a teach back where if, if it allows for it, if not in session, post session, you allow for that, that seller to say, okay, here's what I learned and here's how I'm going to institute it and, and make make sure that it, that it really locked in and that they grasped it. So I think some way of communication after the learning session or some type of teach back or, or quiz or survey or test is, is one way to lock that information in. Yeah. Superpower of uh, enablement there. There you go. I love it all. Very, all, all great, great, great points. Um, okay, great. So we only got a few minutes left here, but I do want to get each of your guys' perspective on what you think are going to be the biggest challenges for new sellers in 2022. I know that. So, so here's, here's my take. Um, a lot of people 
got hired during the pandemic virtually. And now they're being asked to go back into a hybrid set or maybe even full time, full time in, uh, in, in office and have never really experienced the war room experience where you have a rep right beside you talking and then you're on a call too. And you're just like in your head and like thinking, am I saying the right stuff? Am I doing it properly when you've actually been remote selling for your entire sales career? I think that's going to probably be one of the biggest roadblocks, but um, I would love to love to hear your thoughts. And Donald, I'll start with you. Yeah. I mean, that was a, that was a, 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 a challenge I had even before that. I remember when I first started, I was like, dang it, I got all these folks around me. They're going to be judging me. And I think that's going to be heightened even more so um, with it. Another feel, another piece I feel that is, uh, you know, maybe affecting folks going in later on this year in 2020, 2022, I'm getting all the years mixed up is, uh, you know, I feel that the the world of personalization is, you know, so many people are personalizing and in, in, in trying to get to that, that's that level. And we've talked about that for so long, for so long, for so long. But one of the things that I'm seeing a trend is, it's not so much like focusing on personalization. You could personalize at scale. And uh, uh, one of the areas that I'm feeling uh, that people in LinkedIn, you're going to see some stuff with this or, or some, some of the data that they have is like this idea of how can I make sure I'm focusing really, really on a problem? I know it sounds like it's old school stuff, but it's just like, can I focus on the problem that the role has? And I feel like for the past two years, you know, we've been having so much, uh, so much emphasis on like, people want to get to know you. They want to be, you know, get to connect with an individual and, and seeing so much personalization, but it's not, you don't need to personalize per se. You can personalize a skill by focusing on challenges and difficulties that that role has. And I think that's where data comes in. And one of those new things that we're going to see is like, you know, even beyond this, uh, there's so, so often I, I give my consent on so many websites and so all over the internet all the time. And my expectation is that if I'm giving you information, I want you to be able to use that data appropriately to be able to speak to what challenges I'm facing. And I think that's where a lot of our buyers are coming in. And I think a lot of BDRs who are really, really focused on this idea. I mean, we're, we're past the area of mass pr- mass producing and just send out a mass tech, a mass email that's generic, but we're also past the personalization. I think it's personalization on the role and the challenges, and that's going to make a big difference. And that's where we are moving to. And some people are doing it already, but I think uh, um, from the, the folks I'm interacting with, I think that's one of the big changes I'll see in 2022. BDRs need to be aware of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, spray, uh, spray and pray is dead. Has been for a long time. Long time, long <laughs> time. Yeah, so spray and pray dead. You know, and again, I'm, I'm making a claim for this. I've seen some of my uh, folks in our community. It's like, I don't, I don't care about the, you don't need to personalize. You don't need to know what kind of dog I have to be able to reach out to me. You just need to can you speak to the problem that I have at hand? Um, and yeah, anyways, that's what yeah, I care about. And like to build on that. I know Sam Nelson talks about this all the time, but like the enemy of SDR productivity is like their inability to prioritize. Cause there's so much stuff. Like I can find what kind of dog you have. I can find <laughs> what city you live in. I can see where you went to school and like try and find all these things to connect, but just being uh, okay. Like wading through all the junk. I mean, like, okay, here's what is most relevant the yeah. fact that you hired somebody in Japan or London may not be relevant to what I'm talking to you about now. And uh, then being able to connect the dots. And I think um, it's it's a been a forever challenge for SDRs, but I think with the constant influx of information that we have, there's all, it's continually growing. It's uh, going to be a, a continued challenge for this year. Yeah. And that's, that's funny you say that, Brooke. I'm actually hopping on a call with Sam in about 20 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> we'll do a, a, a webinar next week, right? So that's uh that's good but uh chris i would love your thoughts and you know on the challenges they're going to face thanks mike you know kind of like what donald was saying about the personalization that is a challenge because uh you have people like donald who are sharing these great things in, in their podcasts about what's happening right so like i can try to take those strategies but maybe the other hundred people on the call also got those strategies so how do i how am i different amongst all the different folks, right? So that, that is a challenge. And like Brooke said, being able to properly prioritize where to spend my time is a challenge. You know, if, if I, to give something, a, another challenge on top of those two, um, I think another one would be if my manager or director isn't on this call and they, they're they not hearing about uh, how to foster a relationship and communicate with my peers and teammates, I think that that's gonna be a big challenge is if the, the company and leadership is not, creating a a collaborative and vulnerable environment i think man you know it, it's going it's going to be tough for a lot of sdrs it's already a tough position and then through through the pandemic uh, you know psychology numbers are going up uh, mental health is is more important now like we're starting to hear and talk more about it but it's 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 still a, a challenge right and and in a role that's already challenging on top of going through a pandemic uh, i think that 
collaborating with your team, communicating with others, being vulnerable and allowing yourself to be in a vulnerable environment is going to be a huge piece uh, that, that companies are, are going to have to, to think about. Hmm. Yep. And it, like the job market, the way it is, um, people are throwing a lot of money at new hire offers uh, in commission plans. And if everyone's at home uh, and you haven't built the culture to your point of retention, Chris, you're right. You're going to have churn and burn all the time because you're going to go to wherever the grass is greener. So I, I think that will be a challenge for sure. Yep. Mm. This has been awesome. Um, I learned a ton from you guys. Thank you so much. Right? This has been such a good conversation. Um, super engaging for, for, for myself and everybody here. Um, so thank you all. I'll let you go. I'll give you five minutes back. I know, Brooke, you got to go right into another boot camp. After this, <laughs> so, um, I'll, uh, I'll give you a little breather. But um, thank you three so much for taking the time, blessing us with your knowledge and expertise and, and, and so on. I had an absolute blast with the three of you. Um, can't wait for Thanksgiving, Donald. It's going to be great. And then I've got another, you know, we've got ours about two months earlier. So you can come up to, to Canada and meet me, right? So um, done, done and done. <laughs> there you go. All, the, all you can, right? So it's, it's all good. But um, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been super fun. Um, I learned a ton. But if we didn't get to any questions that you guys may have, um, go follow Brooke, Chris, and, and Donald on LinkedIn. I'm sure they'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you, that you have for them. Um, and, uh, and again, thank you so much, Flock J, for, uh, for sponsoring this, uh, this webinar. Um, they're doing some really cool stuff. So go check them out if you don't know what, uh, what they're all about. Um, but without further ado, thank you three again so much. And I'm really looking forward to doing it again soon.